So a key property of matching model is that buyers and sellers, uh, they're always happy to trade. Uh, so when they found, when the buyer find a seller um, that he likes um, you know, through the matching function, and when the seller is able to get a buyer for their services, they're always happy uh, you know, uh, to do the trade, to do the exchange. So, you know, the formal statement is that any time that there is an exchange, there is a bilateral surplus from the trade, so that both the buyer and the seller, um, they, are, they take something away from the trade. They are strictly better off trading than not trading. Um, and I think that's quite a realistic feature of the model, because in real life, if you think about it, you know, Sellers are usually always happy to sell anything. Um, when you're looking to buy for something and you're able to find what you're looking for, people usually um, also, you know, uh, feel good about uh, buying what they were looking for. Um, so I think having a bilateral surplus from the trade is in fact quite realistic. It's not something that you would have in a Valrasian model. You know, the Valrasian model, um, well, the, the marginal. Uh, buyer and the marginal sellers they are indifferent between uh, you know buying and selling and not buying and selling because the price is just exactly equal to their marginal cost of production for the seller or their marginal utility or marginal rate of substitution um, for the buyer whereas here um, everybody is always happy to trade um, so that's going to, that i think is quite realistic furthermore it will have um, important and interesting theoretical properties. Um, so it will allow us to cover, you know, to introduce that. In fact, that's what will allow us to introduce uh, the, you know, the price norms that we've introduced that would be sustainable because we have bilateral surplus. Um, and it will also, you know, as we'll see, it will allow us to explore a bunch of different uh, price setting mechanisms that split this bilateral surplus between buyer and seller. Um, so theoretically, uh, it's quite a, an interesting property. Um, and it's quite convenient because it gives us the freedom to actually uh, make assumptions about realistic price norms. Um, so um, to be able to see all this, um, let's try to compute the bilateral surplus that comes from the trade in the model and establish that in fact, um, there is always a bilateral uh, surplus. Um, so the starting point here um, is to <coughs> look at uh, to recall what the utility function is, and then see, uh, and then see what is it that um, buyers and sellers take away from the trade. So you remember that we introduced uh, utility function, which we denoted So we had the utility function with the utility u of c consumption of services m over p real wealth which here is real money balances again the functional form we have was key over one plus key c so minus one over epsilon plus one over one plus key M over P, epsilon minus one over epsilon. So that's what we had introduced. Okay, so uh, what we'll need to figure out is, um, you know, what is it that both sides uh, take away from the trade? So what is it that buyers take away from the trade? What is it that sellers take away from the trade? So for that, we'll need to figure out what is the marginal utility of one more service and what is the marginal utility uh, of money because sellers will take away money from the trade and buyers will take away a service uh, from the trade. So what's the marginal utility of one service? Marginal utility of services. So if we add one service, if we're able to buy one service, what's the marginal utility? So it's going to be TUDC. And that's just going to be key over one plus key, epsilon minus one over epsilon. C minus one over epsilon. All right, so, uh, <clears throat> and this marginal utility uh, of services, uh, so that's what the buyer 
takes away from trade. And so, of course, we'll have to compare that to what they have to part with, which is money, and then we'll have to uh, see also, um, you know, on the seller front, what is that they take away, uh, what they take away from the trade. But at least on the buyer front, that's what they will take away. They'll be able, the trade occurs to get uh, one more service. So that's the marginal utility of services. Okay. So now we have to figure out also what the marginal utility of money, because that's what the buyer will have to, uh, you know, we know that there is a price here and so the buyer will have to part with money. So what will the, what would be the cost for the buyer? So that we can figure out what is the surplus for for the buyer from the trade. So what is our marginal utility of money? So it's du dm. So here we're looking at nominal money. Okay, so it's going to be one over one plus k. If we go up a bit, uh, then we have epsilon minus one over epsilon. And we have m over p minus one over epsilon. And of course, uh, since we took the derivative with respect to m, there is also a one over p that's going to come out. Okay, and so here's a p, uh, here's a p that we have here, that's just the aggregate price level that enters to compute real money balances or real wealth. So we, we've computed um, what the buyer takes away from the trade by computing the marginal utility of consumption. So now uh, the next step is to compute what the seller takes away from the trade. Now, if you're a seller, what you take away is that you get, you know, the, the price of the transaction is Pn given by the price norm. So you're going to take away Pn units of money. And so the question is, how much is that worth to you? So to do that, we to infer what, what it's worth to the buyer, we computed the marginal utility of money, which we have here. And so this is what the buyer gets from one unit of money. Now, if we have PN units of money, uh, so if we if we have PN unit of money, the utility from that is going to be, uh, the utility is going to be PN, the price, the amount of money, times the marginal utility of money. And so that's just going to be Pn over P, one over one plus K, epsilon minus one over epsilon, M over P minus one over epsilon. Okay. Um, and this we can simplify it a bit if we, if we evaluate it actually around the solution of the model. So we know that, um, we know that in the model, at the end of the day, the amount of money that all households uh, are going to hold is just equal to mu, the endowment of money, um, because all households are uh, exactly the same. Um, so we had established that. So we know that all households hold mu, units of money. That's something we had established um, earlier because of course, you know, the money is not going anywhere. So the money that was at the beginning is the money that's going to be at the end. Um, so we can rewrite the utility from the trade derived by the buyer, uh, by the seller, sorry. So the seller experiences a utility that's going to be uh, dm so we can simplify it as Pn over P, 1 over 1 plus K, Epsilon minus 1 over Epsilon, Mu over P minus 1 over Epsilon. Okay, and so this is what, so in the same way earlier we had figured out uh, what the buyer takes away from the trade, and this is what the seller takes away from the trade. Okay, um, so this is what these guys take away from the trade. Now, of course, to compute a surplus, 
So we could say, you know, uh, the, the total amount that's taken away from the trade would be the sum of the two things. But to compute a surplus, we've got to comp it's a surplus. So we've got to compare what they take away from the trade with what they would have taken away if the trade didn't occur. That's why, you know, we're looking at a trade surplus is what, what is it that the trade brings to sellers and buyers on top of what they would get if there was no trade. So to compute what the buyer takes away, what the seller takes away, we've got to compare you know, to compute the surplus, we've got to compare what they take away with what they would take away if there was no, uh, if there was no trade. So, uh, what would happen if there was no trade? So if there was no trade, and it's it's important to look at this to look at this hypothetical situation with no trade to be able to compute a surplus. So if there was no trade, what would happen? Uh, so if there was no trade, so um, let's look at our seller. So with a trade, we know that they get PN units of money and they'll enjoy that. If there was no trade, what would happen? Well, nothing because, uh, you know, it's the seller brings all these services to the market for sale. They are ready to sell. But if the trade doesn't occur, um, you know, we're in a static model. If the trade doesn't occur now, then there's no trade that's going to happen. And the seller would be, uh, em you know, the seller would be empty and they, they wouldn't get, they don't benefit from the service that they put for sale because they can't consume their own service and they wouldn't get any money. Uh, so the seller, if there was no trade, gets zero. Okay, so that's pretty simple. What about the buyer? What would a buyer get away from the trade, uh, get away if it didn't happen? Well, if the trade doesn't happen, of course, the buyer can't experience the utility from the service, but the buyer would keep their PN units of money and they could always enjoy that, right? Because if they don't spend the PN units of money on the service, they can just keep the money and, uh, and, and you know, so it means they, they can have extra money, extra wealth, and that, uh, that's something that they enjoy because it enters their utility function. So the buyer would get, the, the buyer gets in a, in a case like this, PN units of money. And uh, we know how much utility that provides, which provides utility. And this we've computed it because the utility uh, from PN units of money is exactly what the seller experiences. Uh, so this is what we have over there. Uh, so we can just write it up. Provides utility, and the utility is just PN DU DM, which uh, we computed is PN over P, 1 over 1 plus key, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, U over P, minus 1 over epsilon. Okay, so the seller wouldn't get anything, but the buyer would still be able to enjoy their money. So from that, we know what buyer and seller get if there is a trade. We know what they would get if there was no trade. So we can compute the surpluses that they derive from trade. Seller enjoys surplus from trade. And so what is this surplus? Well, we can denote it big S. Oops. Uh, yes, and basically the surplus is what they get if the trade does occur, which as we've said is Pn over P. Uh, and minus zero, because uh, if the trade doesn't occur, the seller gets zero. Something, oh, so uh, this is what the seller uh, enjoys. Um, and something that we can, uh, well, I guess something that we can do here is uh, we can simplify a bit this uh, surplus in the, you know, in practice, all prices are given by the price norm. So it means that uh, in the model, it means that the aggregate price level P is just the same as Pn 
our price norm because here you know we are looking at a model in which all households are the same and all prices are going to be the same uh, and so that allows us to simplify a little bit um, the surplus from from trade in a case where uh, in this case in which all prices are the same And so because all prices are the same given by the price norm, Pn is equal to P. Okay, given the assumption we've made, and therefore the surplus is going to simplify to S, Pn over P that we have in front is going to disappear, so it's just going to be 1 over 1 plus K, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, mu over P, which is real wealth, minus 1 over epsilon. So that's what we get uh, here. Now we can uh, compute. So this is going to be, uh, and we can see this is strictly positive. Uh, this is what uh, our seller is going to take away from the trade. We can do the same with the buyer. So what's going to be the buyer surplus here? So we'll call it B. It's going to be um, the, you know, the plus side. If the trade occurs, you get the utility from consumption, which is what we had over there. Yes, uh, marginal utility from services. So it's going to be Q over 1 plus Q, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, C minus 1 over epsilon. Okay, and uh, but of course, the outside option of the buyer, what the buyer would get if actually no trade occurs, is not zero, unlike for the seller. Um, it's the utility they would get from keeping the money from the trade. So, um, the outside option that we have to subtract from uh, that utility to get a surplus to see what extra utility the trade provides is going to be uh, what we had over there, so minus Pn over P. 1 over 1 plus k, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, uh, mu over p minus 1 over epsilon. Okay. Um, so that's the surplus from the trade. So here we can simplify ju just a little bit. So we can take 1 over 1 plus k out, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon out. And so you get k c minus 1 over epsilon, minus Pn over P, mu over P, minus 1 over epsilon. So this is our buyer surplus. Now, of course, same assumption as earlier. All prices are given by the price norm. All prices are the same. Uh, so we can simplify just even... Uh, we can simplify that a little bit more by noting that so the price level P is the same as the price norm in that transaction PM. Uh, so we get 1 over 1 plus K, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, K C minus 1 over epsilon minus, and the PN over P, this is just 1, so it drops out. So we subtract the over P minus 1, minus 1 over epsilon. And this is because all prices are the same. Okay, uh, so that allows us to subtract that. So this is what we have from the for the buyer surplus. Uh, and so now you may wonder, well, you know, in this uh, square bracket, we have a positive term with consumption C, we have a negative term with uh, real wealth mu over P. How do we know that actually the buyer is able to derive some uh, is able to derive a surplus from the trade. We don't know that this is positive. Well, except that uh, you remember that the first order condition, you you know, C, which is the amount of consumption that the buyer uh, buys, is not random. You know, it's given by the uh, optimization problem from the household. The household is going to maximize, 
If you remember, there's utility subject to budget constraint that tells us what C is, and C is not random actually. And it turns out that C is always such that it's low enough such that the buyer surplus is always going to be positive. In fact, uh, uh, that's you know because of course uh, you know buyers are going to visit shops and try to engage in trades only when they know that they'll get a positive surplus for, from it. Um, so you remember from the first order condition from the households uh, utility maximization problem. What was uh, that? Uh, so that first order condition, which is what uh, we actually had used uh, to compute the aggregate, you know, that's what we had used. Oops. To compute the aggregate demand curve. So that first order condition had told us that uh, key C minus one over epsilon is equal to one plus tau x uh, mu over p minus one over epsilon. Um, so this comes from, you know, this was derived as we were uh, solving the household problem. Okay, so then if we, now if we, if we plug that in, what do we get for the buyer surplus? So the buyer surplus, I'm going to replace here the key C minus one over epsilon here by its expression that comes from the first order condition. So which tells us basically how much consumption households aim to purchase. So it's going to tell us like what the marginal utility is going to be, uh, is going to be in practice. And so the, so we'll get that the bear surplus is one over one plus key epsilon minus one over epsilon. And then I will have one plus tau x mu over p minus one over epsilon minus mu over p minus one over epsilon. Okay, and so this can be, uh, of course, simplified and we get one, 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 one plus key, epsilon minus one over epsilon. And you notice that there is a mu over p, the power of minus one over epsilon that's going to drop out from our square bracket. And we are just left with tau x, mu over p minus one over epsilon. So this is the buyer surplus, and in the same way that the seller surplus was positive, you notice everything here is positive first term, epsilon minus one or epsilon that's positive because epsilon is strictly greater than one. Tau x is our matching wedge is positive, and mu over p is going to be positive as well. So we found that uh, the seller surplus is positive. So it means that, you know, for any price norm that we use, uh, here the seller is always happy to sell uh, a service. We found that the buyer surplus is also positive. We've just established that. So again, it means that, you know, given the uh, you know, given the behavior of the household, given that they only go to visits when they know that it's going to, you know, give them uh, enough utility, uh, you know, I mean, given how our household behave, whenever they match with the sellers, they are always they get a strictly positive uh, surplus from the match. So the utility from the service is always strictly more than um, what they would do with the money if the trade didn't occur. Um, so there is always a positive buyer surplus. Um, so sellers are happy to sell, buyers are you know, strictly happy to sell, buyers are strictly happy to buy. And so as a result, the total surplus from the match is going to be positive as well.
and this total surplus we can denote it by t it's the sum of the seller surplus for the buyer surplus and it's strictly positive for any match uh, that happens uh, so buyers and sellers are always happy uh, always happy to trade here um, in our model and we have the expression here for the buyer surplus and here for the seller surplus <clears throat> 